Um, but I have to do uh, to make two limitations. Um, Mr. Jordan said that after I was a high school student, a uh, high school teacher, I went back into research and I worked in a group of researchers uh, that studied the relations between East Germany and West Germany on different fields. So I covered the field of literature. Um, there were people covering musicology, how music was different in East and West on classical music. So very specific. Very good. Um, and there were, of course, many historians. There's a running joke, running gag between historians. The worst enemy of the historian is the witness, the people who actually lived that time. Because they're never going to tell you what <coughs> they want to write down in your history books. They're always telling their own story that does not fit into how simple you want you want it to, have, to be. So this is the first limitation. I can tell you only from my personal account. I try to base it on facts, but sometimes my facts are different from what you would find in these circles. And the second limitation is um, that I'm, apart from being an individual, I have my own mind. And I have my own point of view on history of Germany and on my own history, on my biography. So I'm not fair. And I don't have to be. <laughs> Everything I say is under pressure of your interpretation. So this is what I would like to do. I have a presentation prepared. I could talk easily for two and a half hours. I enjoy myself hearing. <laughs> um, but this is not the point. So but there will be time for question and answer. But if you have any questions, if you have any remarks, if you think, but he's talk what is he talking about? Shut up. Um, then please raise your hand and then I would like to come into a conversation, into a communication. Thank you. Um, so first part, living with the war, uh, living in divided Germany. So this is Germany nowadays. And just a brief summary, you probably know or know this already. Uh, this is Germany nowadays. After the end of World War II, uh, Germany was occupied by the four allies, United States, uh, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Please do not say Russia, it was the Soviet Union. Um, uh, parts of Germany, parts of Germany were given to Poland, parts of Germany were given to France, and this is what became Germany. So we had uh, four uh, zones, the Soviet zone would be this area, the British zone in this area, the French, and the American. And we would have Berlin, in just in the middle of the Soviet zone, and also split up into four parts, the Soviet sector, American, French, and British sector. For some reason, you probably know from your AP history classes, the Western, Western allies got along well with each other, not with the Soviets. So in 1949, two states, two German states were founded. The first, West Germany, the British, the French, and the American sector formed, uh, zone, sorry, zone formed West Germany, so-called Federal Republic of Germany. And one month later, the Soviet sector was transformed into the so-called German Democratic Republic. Berlin, officially, was never part of one of those countries. Officially, West Berlin was never part of one of these countries, though the East Germans turned their share of Berlin into the capital of East Germany, and the, four, uh, the three sectors of the Western Allies turned into West Berlin. And this was the case until 1989, until the war came down, and then not even one year later, October 1990, uh, when the German, the Germany was really defined. Now, even though when in 1949 those countries were formed, you could easily move from one part to the other. It was a border, you had to show your passport, and then you could. 1955, 1955, the East Germans built a fence, built up a fence on their border to West Germany. So from 1995, you needed to have a permission to cross this border. But still, Berlin was an open city. So you could still, in the late 1950s, go to East Berlin, walk across the street into West Berlin, and from there, take a train or fly into West Germany. This was the little hole from 1955 until then, August 1961, when the Berlin Wall was built. You know the date? 13th of August, 
one Sunday morning, two o'clock in the morning. So if you would go out Saturday night, have one beer too many, and stumble back home the next Sunday morning, you would run into a barbed wire. This is how the war looked in the beginning. So this is Checkpoint Charlie, actually, when you go to Berlin. This is back here, is Checkpoint Charlie. When you go there, have a look, because you still can't see this dark. This building still stands there. Uh, you have this little fence, little barbed wire fence with uh, border patrols, with soldiers, policemen standing there. But the wall was standing uh, for 28 years. And over the, these 28 years, the system of the Berlin Wall uh, was um, intensified. So the barbed wire was um, replaced by a brickstone wall. Those buildings standing close to the wall um, were emptied and the windows were, were closed. And the last stage of the Berlin Wall would look like this. Actually, two walls. If you look at the actual wall, this is one. This is about 10 feet high. Not too high. You could kind of easily climb over it. But the problem was to get even close to the wall. The actual Berlin Wall was a system of walls, of two walls. You have the wall on the actual side of the border. And deep inside East Berlin, you had a second wall. And in between, you had this death strip. Guards patrolling, dogs watching, self-shooting installations, landmines. So you could, if you wanted to go from east to the west, you could not uh, go even close to the actual. About 150, depending on who counts, about 150 people died in Berlin trying to climb over that wall. About 350 in all over Germany over the course of 20 years trying to get from east to west. Um, so the wall was built, and we have now two German states, two German countries. What did they know from each other? Do you have any idea? Did they know anything? Imagine building a wall to, I don't know, Iowa, Indiana. What could you know from people in Indiana? Sorry? Isolated. Yeah. So you just know what you hear from like phone calls and stuff like that. Phone calls? What else? Could people talk? Could people phone their friends? Probably not. Probably not. Probably not. No. They still it was really the wall, the Berlin Wall was built overnight. And families and friends were split up. <laughs> and for the next three years there was absolutely no way. There was no way getting in touch with your friends or frenemies on the other side. And only three years later, 64, the East German government slowly gave allowance, gave permission to some people from the West coming to visit their families in the East and the other way around. But you had to be a very pro-East German person. You had to support East Germany in order to get one of these permissions. And of course, you could not take your family. So if you wanted to visit your friends in the West, they wanted to make sure that you are married and you have children. And they stay in East Germany. So you have a reason to come back. On the other way around, when you wanted to come from West Germany and visit your friends in East Germany, you had to pay an entrance fee. There was a running gag that people from West Germany, when they went to the East, they said, they're going to the zoo. And they look at these East German people, how funny they are. And we have to pay an entrance fee. Because the German economy, East German economy, was so terribly down. And they needed money. They needed the good Western money. People had to pay to get into East Germany. Another way of getting in touch with each other was uh, phone calls. About 16% in 1989, so we're not talking about the time immediately after the wall was built. We're talking now about 1689 at the end of East Germany, 16% of the households had a phone. Because of the bad economics, and because they wanted to control them, they wanted to spy, they wanted to hear, they did not want to, you to talk to your people in West Germany and complain about the East Germany. This is, this is a subway station, Friedrichstraße. 
in the middle of Berlin. This was one subway station where trains were coming from West Berlin and trains were coming from East Berlin. This was one of the places where people could cross the border. And you had to leave if you wanted to come from west to even go to east. You had to go to Freistraße to the train station, had to get off the train, go in a tunnel, go through this area, and get on the platform on the other side. Those two platforms were divided by a wall. So in the middle of the train station, you have two tracks. And in between these two tracks, they build a wall. So you could not just jump over to the other side. And this area, this hall, was called the Hall of Tears. Palace of Tears, because when they came back after visiting their friends and families in East Berlin, they had to wait for them. Now there's a beautiful museum telling you the story about the war. Um, when you have family in another state or in another country and you visit them once a year, twice a year, what do you know about that? Are you, do you know how to die? Yes. Do you know how they feel every single day? Do you know when they go to work and they have a bad day? No, you don't. You know, you don't. And this is the point. Even though they were officially, theoretically, still in contact, they lived in two different worlds. They could not talk with each other every single day. They could not go. Oh, I'm going to go over and visit Paris. This is the point that later, when Germany was reunified, caused a lot of tension. Um, because people thought, oh, we are German, we are all German. But actually, we are not quite. We are a little bit different. Um, let me tell you a little bit about some, um, some topics regarding life in East Germany before I come to one that I'll would like to talk a little bit about you. These are pictures from um, uh, factories in East Germany. Economy in Germany, East Germany was terrible for different reasons. One was the planned economy. After the Soviet model, after the Eastern communist model, uh, there was a five-year plan and seven-year plan. So uh, the administration wants to plan how the economy will go, what we will, will we sell in five years' time. So now we plan that in five years' time we're going to have a bunch of blue coats and everyone is buying blue coats. And socks could be green. Now if you imagine a market trying to plan five years ahead what people might need in five years' time, that's a stupid thing to do. The other thing is that um, the Western people in West Germany had big support, mainly from the United States, due to a thing called the Marshall Plan. After World War II, Western allies, and mainly in the States, supported West Germany financially, economically. Have you heard about a, a person named Morgenthau, Secretary of Finances in the 1940s, American? He had a different plan with Germany. Before World War II ended, he had a plan, let's bomb down Germany, let's take all their economy, let's, then, let's, all the Germans, let's turn all the Germans into farmers so they are busy farming the whole day and never think about politics again. He convinced Roosevelt. He convinced Churchill. Fortunately, for me, it never happened. It never <laughs> happened. And the Marshall Plan was realized. Um, this, this was the case. And this was the case in, uh, in, in West Germany, especially in the south of West Germany. This was not the case in East Germany. The Soviets had different plans. They wanted to have reparations for all the destruction caused by the Germans in World War II. So they, when they came into East Germany, whatever little thing they found that was still existing, train tracks, factories, whatever, they took and brought it into the Soviet Union. So economy-wise, both states, West Germany and East Germany, they had completely different grounds from where they could start. And together with the social idea of the economy, that caused the big difference between West German economy, which is similar to what you know as a working economy, and the socialist economy. Um, 
there was no, and this is when you ask people what are the benefits of East Germany, what do we miss about East Germany, there was no unemployment. Not one single person had no job in East Germany. Unemployment did not exist officially. Because this was a side effect. You didn't know if you don't have work for everybody and you just employ people, they are sitting on the park bench waiting for their time to be over. When you read accounts of people coming from West Germany or from Western countries going into factories in East Germany, they can tell you, well, two people are working and three people are watching over their so shoulder telling them what to do. This would be a typical scene from an East German factory. Or, even in the 1980s, building cars with a screwdriver. Because like this, you can employ many people if you just keep them busy. By the way, this is a typical East German car, Trabant. You might have seen them. When I was in Cleveland, I went to the Rock Hall. They have the original Trabants from the U2 album from the baby, 1990. <laughs> um, this car is the typical German, East German car, Trabant. And everyone made fun of it because they called it the cardboard car because they thought it was made of cardboard, which is not true. It was made out of plastic, much more efficient. Um, and uh, it's a very small, stinky, smelly, noisy car. When you come to Berlin, you can do a Trabant Safari drive. You know? And because of the economy, because the economy was so bad, you had to wait 13 years to get one of these cars. You would not go into a store and say, I need a car. That's right. You and 13 years later, you would get one. In many cases, when people got a baby, they would go and register their baby to apply for a car. So at some point, it, it might go to happen. This is, in brief, how economy worked. And this is what was caused by this failing or defunctioning economy. Um, one of the things the East German propaganda did, talking about the West, was telling you, of course, everything, all the bad things about the West, like unemployment. People don't have job, don't get money to live, which is true. We don't, and we didn't have that in East Germany. We did not have homeless people. Everyone had a. We did not have anybody who was starving. The cost of living in East Germany was very, very low. You would pay a rent for a rent for a two-room bedroom apartment per month about 150 bucks. And you would need the same amount to feed your family for the whole month. Very cheap. But in order to buy a car or a stereo or a TV, you would have to spend a load of this is the difference. Everything that you needed for your all day life, food, clothing, rent, books, it's very cheap. Everything else, everything out of the ordinary. You had to wait in line, and you had to be lucky to get one of these items. Another problem caused by this defuncting, defunctioning economy was uh, housing. <coughs> Germany was, of course, destroyed after the war. In Berlin, in the mid center of Berlin, about 80% of the city center completely destroyed. And the same in other areas of Germany, especially in the uh, industrial areas, especially in the cities. Now, again, in West Germany, with the Marshall Plan, with the connection to the Western market, to the Western economy, um, housing was not a big problem if you could pay it. In East Germany, that was a problem. And building apartments, providing everyone with a home, was one of the main targets of East German economy. East German government, every five years, made a plan. In five years, we're going to have houses, we're going to have apartments for everybody. But they never managed. They never managed. And because they were building so many new houses, even new many, so many apartments, even though they were never sufficient, older apartments, existing apartments, looked like this. People were living in these conditions. 
because all most of the apartments, most of the houses were government owned. So nobody living in these apartments had any interest in putting money into their apartments. And the government didn't have the money, didn't have the energy to take care of this. I said, I told you, 16% of the households in 1989 had a telephone. 25% of all the apartments in East Germany, 1989, did not have a toilet in the apartment. They had a toilet either one flight of stairs down or in the courtyard. 25%. 25% of the houses did not have any kind of shower, bathtub whatsoever in the apartment. These are people that are lucky. They all have apartments. Probably they have a bathroom. Probably they have a shower or a bathtub. And this is one um, component on, of living in East Germany that I would like to focus a little bit about. Um, if you live in, in a socialist society, and just a side note, when I talk about East Germany, you might notice I never use the word communist, because East Germany, by definition, by self-definition, was never communist. If you look at Czechoslovakia, Poland, the Soviet Union, Hungary, they all had a communist party. They all understood themselves as communist countries. East Germany, for historical reasons, for reasons of the Nazi period, did not define themselves as communists, never. They defined themselves as socialist with the goal at some point in the bright future we're gonna turn into communists. So this is a, just a little remark. Um, if you live in a socialist um, society, the society expects you to be happy and to, jo uh, to um, share your happiness and your joy with everyone. So if you would live in an apartment building, you had to share everything with everybody. Everyone knew everything about everybody. And if you would try to isolate that yourself, you would look suspicious. These people would meet twice a year, three times a year, to clean up the house, to clean up the area, have a little garden. They would meet once a month for an evening to have a barbecue together, to have a drink too many together. They would meet. And if you would not attend these meetings, these meetings of joy, these festivities, you would look suspicious. If you would live... Daniel, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. What, no, what factors kind of determine whether you got an apartment with a bathroom or... Um, good question. Um, if you had children, chances would be better that you get one of these modern apartments. If you would be a member of the Socialist Unity Party, which was not the only party, but the main uh, political party in East Germany, and you would be a devout member of this party, and you would be a good member of the socialist community, your chances are higher. If you have some sort of, an, um, of a rank in the administration, be it in the party, or in the school, or wherever, then your chances, chances would be higher um, to, uh, be, to get one of these apartments. If your parents, uh, the East Germany understood themselves as a country for the ordinary people, they called themselves the workers and farmers country, Arbeiter and Bauernstadt. So if your parents would be a factory worker or a farmer, the chances would be higher to get an apartment, to get a career, than if your father would be a doctor or a lawyer. Same applies for school careers. You come, want to come later in school career. Just say. Um, you could not go to high school and to university if you wanted to. In every class of about 25 students, there was one or two places uh, on high, at high school or university. And the teacher decided who would go to university. He would not exclusively decide, depending on your grades, depending on your needs. He would also decide, depending on your behavior, towards the socialist community, and depending on your background, your 
from family background. So if your father or mother would be farmers, and you would have the same grade like your fellow student, whose farmers would be a lawyer, uh, whose parents would be a lawyer, and your chances are higher. Um, was it all apartments, or were there houses too? Uh, there were houses too. There were houses too, um, but again, most of them were destroyed. Um, most of the houses, most of the apartments were government owned, and in order to provide housing for as many people as possible, it was cheaper to build apartments apartment buildings than individual homes. So there were individual homes that came from pre-World War II, but if there were houses new built, built after the war during the East, Common, uh, East German, it would be m mostly exclusively. So uh, if you were in a house before, you yeah. would be removed from that and probably put in an apartment? Yeah. Or you would think? Yeah. So this is um, one of the book, this books. It's called a house book. Or apartment house book. Um, there was one in charge among this group of people, these nice people dressed up, taking a picture in front of the front door. Um, one of them was in charge for taking care of everyone in the house. If someone would come to you to visit you, you, this person had to go to the other person first, say, hello, I am, this is my ID, I come to visit this person for different reasons. And they would have to register in this book. And only then they could come to have a cup of tea with Happy Pioneers. Pioneers was the youth organization, not only in East Germany, in most of the East European countries. There was, were these guys with the blue ribbon, grade one to grade three, with the red ribbon, grade four to grade seven, and from grade eight, you would have these people here in the background that have a blue glass. You did not have to be a member of this organization. Even though they covered almost 90% of all the students at all ages. You were not, it was not a law that you have to be a member of this institution. But then again, if you wanted to go to high school, you better find your way here. If you don't want to have and be in trouble, you better find your way. This was, by definition, a socialist um, group. So from grade one, the socialist personality would be developed. And they understood themselves as the, I don't know, kindergarten of the Socialist Unity Party. Socialist Unity Party, again, not being the only party, but the biggest, and de facto, the only part, because they decided. They also decided about all the other political parties. And again, they had meetings every week. They had um, parades. They were helping the elderly. But it was, at the same time, a group to control each other. Because if you have a group of students and they live all together, they do everything together, then you can control them. Anybody of you playing football? Football? Yeah? Mm -hmm. You would be in the football department of this group. Anybody in a chess club? No, chess is not school. Mm -hmm. Any other club? Theater? Musical? Katie's a marching band. Marching wow. band. Marching band. You would be in the marching band depart department of this group. Now I'm telling, Thanks, Dan. telling you one funny thing. Um, I ha always had a crush on language. Um, and since I was born in East Germany, I had to study Russian as the first foreign language. I was quite good. And uh, I loved dealing with languages, so I went to the Russian language group that did not belong to the school. It was something completely different. I had, there was a situation, I had a trouble, some trouble with the teacher. I was not a, I was not a good kid. Um, I had some trouble with the teacher, I was suspended. And the next time I went to that Russian language club, this person from the Russian language club asked me, what happened in school? What did you do there? And there was, 
for me at this time, no way of understanding how the heck does she know. Because this Russian language club had absolutely nothing to do with my school. Well, in the back side, in the background, they did. Because they all belonged to one big, one big group, and everyone knew everything about everything. Has someone of you seen the movie The Lives of the Others? German movie about um, the Secret Service in East Germany, the Stasi, won an Academy Award in 2006, ignorance. Um, the, Stasi, <laughs> the Stasi was the Secret Service in East Germany. And now, I don't want to focus ex exclusively on the Stasi, on the Secret Service. There are historians that define East Germany as like a Kraken. And the Stasi is the only thing that exists in East Germany. I don't see it this way. But the Stasi, in my understanding, and the Secret Service and the surveillance, the controlling each other, was one big, maybe the most important component of life in East Germany. In a factory. Well, I have heard that your colleague does not like the government. Could you tell us a little bit about it? In a family. Do you mind telling us what is kind of newspaper your wife is reading? And actually, there was one very famous case that one lady, Vera, Vera Lengsfeld, uh, she was working in the 1980s in the East German resistance. In the East German resistance, her husband spied on her, and every little word she said was written down by him and transferred to the secret service. She was wondering, how did they know that? I'm so careful. I don't speak openly on the phone. I'm very careful who I talk to in public. How do they know? Her husband. And this brings me to another, another thing. Um, when you know there are many spies, that impacts your behavior. That desperately it impacts your behavior. If you, even if you don't know for sure, but if you think someone might be tapping my telephone, you're not talking about everything. Or you are very brave and very ironic, and then and this is what many people did when they picked up the phone. Hello, my friend, this is me talking, and for those of the Secret Service listening to you, good day to you as well, sirs. Um, if you go into a bar, have a drink, complain about your life, complain about, I cannot get an apartment, and now it's another 10 years working for this plastic car, you had to expect that someone in this bar was working for the Stasi, for the Secret Service. We are about 35, 40 people, so about four of us are spying for the Stasi. And I'm telling them what you're saying, too. <laughs> and the thing is, you never know who it was. And you never knew if there were not two. So if you were a spy, and thinking about, I'm tired of doing this, you could be sure that there's someone else in the room. So if you don't give the information, they still get the information, and they get the information that you are not proceeding with the information properly. The start, in East Germany, there were about 60 million citizens. They had about 18 million files. They had more files than actual people. If you build a line of these files, they're about 250 miles long. Jeez. And it's, at some point, it's ridiculous. Um, when the wall came down, and after reunification, those files that were not destroyed by the Stasi um, were transferred to an office, to a uh, an office of the administration that was in charge of these files, so they could be uh, read by those people who were spied on and by researchers. 
and some of the people that lived in the or worked in the, in the resistance in the underground of East Germany and were reading their thoughts, they just they said that's just hilarious. Um, they wrote down what time I get up, how strong I like my coffee. If I prefer to wear red socks or green socks, it's just ridiculous. But on the other hand, how do they know how strong I make my coffee? Because probably I have a microphone somewhere, a bug somewhere in my apartment. Or maybe someone being with me in the morning when I make my coffee is telling them. There are other occasions when people come home and they say, okay, so here's my apartment. It looks kind of different. I would never put these books in this shelf. I would always put them in the other shelf. And it's starting to do it on purpose. Sometimes they were just showing the books, and sometimes they were just putting everything a little bit out of order, so you are aware of the fact they keep an eye on you. So messy if someone did that to my room, I don't think I'd notice. Well, they would, they would probably they would clean tidy up your room. Oh, wow. <laughs> probably they would tidy up your room just in order to answer some confusion. Um, so, yeah, so now I'm sitting here. Yeah, 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 I'm sitting here. So John told you, um, I did research, um, after working in high school, I went back uh, into academics, I did research in the relations between East German and West German literature. And part of my research included um, going to this office that was in charge of the old Stasi files to go have a look into some of these files um, of East German writers or West German writers and authors um, if they were affected. Um, and just for fun, you had to fill out a form for every single file you had you wanted to see, and that was a big mess because you had to know the number of the file, which is, and you have 18 million files, not an easy task. Uh, but just for fun, I wrote one of these documents with my name. Do I have a file? And now keep in mind, I was born in 1975. So when the war came down, 1989, I was 14 years old. I did not really expect to have a file, but I did. This is my entire file. <laughs> Only one piece of paper is my entire file. <laughs> you see my name, date of birth, that was my number, that was my address. This red stamp is that A, this office keeps the original, I just got a copy of this entry. Um, there's a handwriting up here, Löschkartei, deleted file. At some point, and nobody knows why, and I don't know why, at some point, someone decided to delete my file. So this is only the front page of what was there. There was more. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it was. I know there was something. I don't know where it went. It is very likely, after the coming down of the wall, it was obvious that Germany would be reunified and all those people working for the Stasi would come to daylight and you could ask them, why the heck did you do that? At this time, the Stasi tried to destroy as many files as possible. They were taking files, putting them into the shredder, burning them. Hundreds and thousands of until at some point the resistance, the opposition in East Germany occupied the offices of the Stasi and stopped them this time. So it's very likely that it, at this point my file was destroyed. But I don't know, and I probably will never know. Another thing that I find interesting is this number. This number shows you um, the department of the Stasi that created my file. Number 15 is the department in charge of espionage of all the countries outside of Germany. So the department for espionage 
maybe with the Soviet Union, maybe France, maybe Italy. That would be great. Yeah, good for them. Maybe the United States. Someone there, at some point, found, had the idea, let's keep an eye on this person. We can maybe use him. I, again, I don't know <laughs> what was the background, and I probably will never know. And now comes the most annoying thing, if you ask me this date. This is the date when this fire was built. December 1987. I was 12 years old. I find that extremely frustrating. Now, something that stops my frustration is this one. Um, we're coming closer to the coming down of the wall. Um, 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev becomes a general secretary in the Soviet Union, and uh, Eastern Europe kind of opens up a little bit. Until then, it was impossible to get uh, Western newspapers, Western books, Western music. One of the evil influences of the capitalist, imperialist West, especially the United States, you were the worst. One of the evil influences was pop music, beat music, Beatles, Rolling Stones, no way. At some point in the 1960s, East Germany invented their own twist music because they did not like the twist music from the West. They invented their own twist music, the so-called Leipzig, named after the town of Leipzig. It was undanceable. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely undanceable. Um, but then in the 1980s, um, everything opened up a little bit in some parts of Eastern Europe. So in the Soviet Union in the 1980s, the Rolling Stones could release an album. My older brother, he's eight years older than me, he bought it in the Soviet Union when he went there, and I borrowed. Yeah, yeah, that's the same borrow. I, I borrowed it from him. And second song on side D is Out of Time. What would you do if, and now I give you a typical situation, you're called to the principal, and the principal tells you, you go to the office, and he tells you, there's a young man who wants to talk to you. And this young man asks you about your class, your fellow students. Are you interested in DQ? You, you want to go to a uh, university? You want to study? You want to go to college? Yeah. What do you want to be doing? I don't know. <laughs> do you want to work in a factory? No. In a supermarket? So you want to have a career? I want to be successful. Do you want to have a career? So you need to go to college. You know that only one of this group here can go to university. And we're not looking only at the grades, we're also looking at cooperation. Do you mind meeting with me for, let's say, every 10 days? Can you tell me a little bit about your fellow student? Mm -hmm. What would you do? Honestly, I would probably do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. If it meant my chances of becoming successful wow. or yeah. I'm sorry, be honest. Yeah. No, no. I think no, that's, that's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah. I mean, I We'd rather know it than not know it, Errol. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which is actually true. Which is actually true. Um, what would you do? Yeah. Oh, I would. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. He says I wouldn't mind it at all. I want to work at home. Danny's very self-interested. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that what they have to offer me, it wouldn't have been worth selling people out necessarily unless they're going to make a better offer than just going to college. Who wants to go to college? Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> Want a plastic car? Any, any, anybody? Plastic cars. Plastic cars. I'll get you a plastic car. Any, you're an idiot. And anybody, anybody that might have uh, problems with dealing with the security, with the security service? With Wait, I have a question. Yeah. Did I have to say bad things? Could I say good things about everyone? Well, they want to know everything. <laughs> well, and, as I, I, and, as I told, and as I told you before, it's very likely that you're not the only person they ask. So they will, they will have another person right. in their resume. So they will know if you tell them everything or not. It's, it's not like, well, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about what I'm telling you and what not. You, you say yes or you s say no. There's no gray zone. At least for the stars. You would say no? I'd say yes. I'd You'd do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> I wouldn't know any better. <laughs> 
I would say no. I have my morals. And how, how, how would you try to say no? Why would you why would you say no? What are your reasons? What is your moral? I don't believe in the I guess I guess people I believe that people should believe what they want to believe and it's not my duty to tell anyone how to believe or to tell others. The On the cost of your career. Um, you will never go to university, I can tell you. <laughs> you, okay. you will you will work in a factory if ever. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. 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 So, like, let's say you say no, and then okay, you worked in a factory. But would there be like other consequences, like to our family, or like would people like disappear to like, gulags? No, no. Uh, there are there. There were no gulags in East Germany. There was in, and we, we look at the whole period <laughs> of time from forty nine until eighty nine. So that's a time span of eighty years. It was not always the same. In the nineteen fifties, nine early nineteen sixties, people were sent to prison. People were executed. People disappeared. In the 70s, 80s, this did not happen. But of course, it might affect your family. If I really want you to work with me, and you say, no, I have my morals, well, and your brother, don't you care about him? I don't know, like, what would you be telling them that's so bad, like, Bobby got an 80 on a math test, so <laughs> well, like, well, well, darn, no. they know what you got. Like, I don't understand, like, what are you going to be doing at school? Like, I don't know that much about the people around me that's really going to make them be a threat. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what I would be telling them that's so bad. <laughs> like, sure, I'll tell them, like, great, okay. Yeah, right. All right, what was the, like, all right, I guess my question is, um, if they weren't going to, like, throw people in jail or kill them towards the later half, then why did it matter? That just seems like a bunch of wasted... If they weren't going to do anything with the info anyway, then why oh, did they... Oh, they work? were. Of course they were. I, I, told, they weren't I told you it was illegal to have Western newspapers, to have Western books. It was, of course, illegal to work against the government. Of course it was illegal to um, process a Rolling Stones album. But they weren't prosecuting those people. Of course they were. They were. Okay, uh, if, okay, it's, okay. if it's illegal, of course I could write something down in the law. Okay. Uh, I make something up, and of course I send them to prison. Okay. If you if you would own Rolling Stones album, <laughs> off you go. <laughs> Two years. <laughs> um, was this like was the position of being like a spy? Would you grow out of that, or would that government affiliation it grow? Would, it would grow when, once you once you make a pact with the devil. There is no way out. Mm -hmm. Actually, there. Well, there is, but you burn yourself. I, I come back to this. <laughs> I come back oh to this. man, I feel that. I do. No, okay. no, All right. So, were, was everybody there? Like, was everybody who was kind of like living in the society? Did they just put on artificial faces and, and just say like, okay, I'll do whatever everybody else wants me to say, but I'll think differently in my head? Or does everyone just kind of eventually give in? and say are actually morally what the government wanted them to be? Good question, good question. So this is what, this is what people do, would do. They would have this, we call it, out of home speech. They would have a mask. So in your family, in your apartment, with the people you really, really, really know, you can talk about everything. But as soon as you leave your comfort zone, you put on a mask and you just deal with it. And this is the most annoying thing about growing up in such a controlling society. Because you never know who is there to talk about you. And even if not everybody works for the Secret Service, everybody forms this, this wall of the official space. Even if you're not opposing the government, you're just, you're just a loner. There is no way of being a loner in a society like this. Um, you were asking about consequences. Of course there are consequences. Any kind of opposition, any kind of not dealing with the group, not being part of the group, would be suspicious. And if you would look, if you would read a Western newspaper or watch Western television, and this is what people could do in East and West, they could watch, because it was the same language, it was German language, they could watch the news from the other side. 
Now, this is what happened in schools in East Germany, because the news in Western East Germany were shown at the same time. Uh, teachers would ask their students, did your parents watch the news? Excuse me. The news yesterday. Yes, they did. Which animal did they see at the news? Because the logos of the news in East Germany and West Germany had different animals. <coughs> West Germany had an eagle. So if the student would say, well, there was an eagle, the teacher would immediately know, well, the parents of the students are watching West German news. And that would not be allowed. Why wouldn't they just say that they saw the other animal? Little kids. Little kids. And this is, and this is, this is what you were asking for, this, um, I put on a mask. This is what actually happened. But nobody spoke, nobody talked about it. I remember when I was 13 years old, or maybe 12, um, my parents went out for a night, and I was at home with my two brothers, and we were watching oh, something very, we were doing something very special. We were watching TV at night. And we were watching Jaws in West German television, mm -hmm. Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. And the next day I went to the school, to the, school, to the courtyard. Of course, everyone has seen Jaws. Have you seen? <laughs> <laughs> and the teacher called me and sent me to the principal. I was not supposed to see Jaws at West German television. You were asking about how to, how do I get out? Or is there a way to get out? Is that true? Yeah. Well, um, I can tell you people, students or adults in East Germany that were asked by the Stasi by the Secret Service to work for them. Not everybody was to go with him as easy as you. <laughs> most, of the, most of the people, they took at least three minutes to think about it. <laughs> they didn't just not just say that, yeah, I'm with it. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a very, it was, well, many, many, many people did for different reasons. They got a little money, not much, a little money. They got a better career, or they just thought, I'm special. You see, oh, the Stasi asked me, I, they asked me about my knowledge. Oh, it must be so important. But many people did not feel like this. Many people did not feel this. Uh, so, how did they get out? Because they had to suffer consequences. Well, one easy way is to conspire yourself, to burn yourself. If you would be a Stasi officer asking me for, for my support, then I would go, you know what? She asked me if I would join the Stasi, if I should spy on the people. Isn't that great? Now everybody knows. Now there's no use for, for that. I'm burned. This is one. Literally? Yes. Oh, okay. Literally. I was making sure. No. Okay. This, this is what many people did. Burn themselves. But of course, on the price of their career. Many people suffered psychologically if they were working for the Stasi or not. Do we have any questions regarding what we just were talking about? How would they go about getting information from you? Did you have, would like a spy have weekly meetings with yeah. the Stasi or what yeah. was going on? Yeah. They, they would have me weekly meetings or every two weeks. Um, they would meet me in a cafe. In many cases, they would meet me in an apartment. Ironically, even though East Germany lacked so many apartments, the Stasi owned quite a bit of apartments that were empty just for the purpose of meeting the spies. And there he, they would meet there with you, they would uh, record the whole conversation, and they would write it down with a typewriter, and they would make you sign it. You are constantly reminded that it is you. And they could use it against you. Because when you work as a spy, when you spy on your friends for, let's say, two years, you don't want anyone to know. Because you're not only afraid of the stars, you're also afraid that your friends don't like you. And they would have good reason. What was it like just having regular friends, like just growing up in this environment? Like being 13 yeah. and worrying about like your friends, like were there more issues with your friends, like talking behind each other's backs? Not just for the government, just like you know, like any normal friend group situation is always going to be like, oh, she said this about me, blah blah blah. Do you think things like that happen more often? What, what do you think? 
Well, no, not not at this time, not not at this age, uh -huh. not when you're 13, not when you're 13, when you're 14, when you just start to think about the big picture. But of course, when you're older, when you turn 20 or 30, of course, you are either suspicious with everybody. And as I said, this lady, she was spied on by her husband. Or you just don't care. And this is what many uh, people in the opposition in the 1980s did. Uh, they said, I know for sure that my telephone is bugged. I know for sure that they have a microphone in my bathroom. So what the heck am I doing about it? I can't do anything about it. So be it. But you have to be brave to do that. Was that what you did? Or was there any like instance where you felt like I don't. I don't recall. You don't. Recall. I, I. I don't recall, and that was what I was saying. I did not expect to see that. Um, I. I don't recall any encounter. Probably there were. Probably they sent me. Principal called me, and they sent, and someone talked to me. But I don't remember that situation. Okay. I don't. I don't recall that situation. It's very likely that they somehow got in trouble, or they asked one of my teachers. Probably one of my teachers was working for them anyway. <laughs> So they were asking, well, you have a class of 25, you have some names for us. Yeah, I was just wondering if there's yeah. any, if you had any notion that maybe no. someone was no. No. Do you think your parents were uh, like conscious and careful and like censored what they told you oh, in definitely. fear that oh, you would accidentally oh, tell definitely. them? Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. But they would not tell me. Yeah. They would not tell me. We're talking about this here, but don't tell anybody outside. So did your relationship with your parents change when, every, when, the, when it was all over? Was um, this is an interesting point that leads to the, the aftermath of okay. growing up in a society. Um, does it, from a psychological point of view, does it deform your personality if you grow up in such a controlling society? How does it affect your relations to the people surrounding you, to your friends? to your family. Um, there is, it's, we cannot compare uh, Nazi Germany and uh, East Germany. Even though both were totalitarian systems, we should never make the mistake to say they are similar, because they are completely different in many ways. But I think one of the things that is the same is the uh, psychological aftermath that people are still feel affected. Even though if they might not be part of the system, not an active part, but they've been part. If you, as I showed you this picture of these pioneers and of these collectives, even those people who were not members of the party, who were not supporting um, the government, they would, in most of the cases, would not do anything in order to oppose the system. They would just try to be as calm and quiet as possible and not to be seen. But they are still a part of this society. If I would think about opposing the system, they would still be part, from, in my eyes, they would still be part of this society. And this is the same. I think in Nazi Germany that nobody really talks about in the beginning. Either if you were supposing it, uh, opposing it or supporting it or if you just want to be neutral. It's done and somehow I was involved but now it's different and I don't want to talk. This is, if you ask me, this is generally the idea in East Germany how, how people, how things should go at least in the 1990s. All right. Anything to miss? No. Then I have a question. Who done it? Who took down the Berlin Wall? Chuck was somehow young, energetic, and kind of wicked. He started in the 1980s uh, a project called Perestroika and Glasnost. You probably have heard of it. Perestroika meaning uh, freedom of speech freedom of thinking to a certain extent, still under the rule of the Communist Party, but to a certain extent. And the other project, Glasnost, was a liberalization of the economy. So slowly, very slowly, private business can be 
but he did not take down the building. But we will come back to church culture. Is this the people of Berlin? It was the people of Berlin, yeah. So, it was not this guy. You probably heard of him. Ronald Reagan, 1987, just behind the Brandenburg Gate, behind the Berlin Wall. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Um, Mr. Gorbachev was not very interested, so it took another two years. But um, what this picture shows us is a, a general stabilization of um, the Cold War, of the situation between the Eastern and the Western Bloc. Um, when the wall came down, nobody expected that to happen. Nobody, absolutely nobody. When Ronald Reagan went to Berlin saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, everyone in Europe understood this as a joke. Nobody, maybe not a joke, but as a rhetoric question, as a rhetoric sentence. Nobody, not even in the West, not even Ronald Reagan, considered the war to come down within the next 25, 50 years. The econ economy in Eastern, <coughs> in Eastern Europe collapsed. The social system, the political system in Eastern Europe changed a lot since Gorbachev came into office. But on the big picture, the two blocks, East and West, seem to be stronger and stronger. So it was not one of them. And it was not this person, David Hasselhoff. <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, people for some reason people think that Germans love David Hasselhoff. If you think that, stop it. It's insulting. <laughs> but what is true is that David Hasselhoff had in night in summer 1989 had his five minutes of fame. He had a big hit. Uh, not only in Germany, in all of Europe, I've been looking for freedom. And for some reason, Mr. David Hasselhoff thinks that his song, I've been looking for freedom, helped the East German government <laughs> to attend. <laughs> 20th, 20th anniversary, 2009, we had a big party in front of the Brandenburg Gate, uh, celebrating uh, the 20th anniversary of the coming down the wall, and he was really upset that he was not <laughs> Um So it was not in either. Um, it is maybe, a little bit his fault. This is uh, Willy Brandt, a uh, West German chancellor uh, in the late 1960s until 1972. Um, I told you that during the Cold War, during the 40 years of the existence of East Germany and West Germany, that was not all the same. So there was a developing situation. In the beginning in the 1950s, uh, Nixon, McCarthy, and we had some equivalents on the other side of the of the wall, and they were very stubborn and had only their point of view, and there was no way of dealing with each other. That changed in the 1960s, and this is a in Germany. It's to a big part his fault, Willy Brandt. And uh, this is a picture in, in Warsaw, first time that a German chancellor, a German politician, goes to Warsaw, where the Nazis. Um, uh, occupied Poland and killed all the Jewish people that were up, uh, uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, Willy Brandt went to Warsaw in 1970 and fell on his knees in front of the memorial dedicated to the Jewish people um, uh, that died in this Warsaw Ghetto. And he was um, the first big politician in Germany um, that accepted German history German World War II history, and also accepted the, uh, the results of World War II, the existence of two different blocs and two different German states. So he said, well, there is another German state. And I cannot constantly say, well, you are not the right German state, because as a matter of fact, they are there. And they're there now for 20 years at this time. So I would like to be in contact with in order to help the people. So not only a few people, a few, few chosen people can cross the wall and visit their people, their friends and families on the other side, more and more people. We can exchange. And maybe at some point Daniel can watch Jaws without being scared that he is sent from school. So since the 1960s, over the course of the 1970s, 1980s, um, both systems 
um, and both German states moved a little bit towards to each other. This is then in 1988. Uh, Willy Brandt had to resign. This is the chancellor uh, that ruled Germany since uh, 1982, um, Helmut Kohl. And this is his East German equivalent, Erich Honecker, in office since 1971. This was the peak of the um, New East politics. That's how we called it, that the West opens up, towards the East. Um, and accepts that there is another German state other than um, the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany. So this was the first time, 1988, more than 40 years after the end of World War II, the first time that the East German head of state went on a visit, an official visit, in West Germany. Just a few years after, both states were acknowledged by the United Nations. On the big picture, the United Nations had a big issue. Which one is the right term? And for a long time, they could not decide. And both German states said, well, if you take this other German state, I'm so out of it. And East Germans said, if you accept the West Germans, I'm out of it as the United States. And the West Germans said, when you accept East Germany, you're going to be in big trouble with the Soviet Union. And this happened. China, June 1989, Tiananmen. And now I would like to tell you something. And remember what I said at the very beginning. This is my story. Yeah. So the day of the coming down of the wall, when I look back at it, is just one day among many others. In the history books, it's the event. But when I personally look back, it is just one day among many others where so many things happened. Since Gorbachev uh, came into office, the old Eastern Empire changed a little bit every single day. Every single day. Uh, because it was very liberal. It was so liberal that in nine, since 1988, you could not buy any German newspaper or any German magazine in East Berlin, in East Germany. All Soviet newspapers and magazines were not delivered in East Germany because they were too liberal. That's kind of ironic. Um, and then this happened in June. Students, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Mao's speech at the Tiananmen Square, occupied that square in China for about three months, and then they were sent away by tanks. This is an iconic picture. Have you seen the video of this, this yeah. person with his two bags? Looks like he comes from a grocery store trying to send away the tanks. Um, and it stands in a row of similar events in, in Eastern Europe. In 1953, uh, construction workers in East Berlin got on the street in order to riot against the Eastern government. 1956, Budapest, Hungary. 1968, Prague. 1980, Poland. And this is just the last drop. At the same time, I was I think that picture was taken on 4th of June, something like that. On the 7th of June, there were elections in East Germany. Uh, now, elections in East Germany, they worked this way. We had one big party, the Socialist Unity Party, and we had five other parties, um, smaller parties. Elections worked this way. Um, you went into a school or into a classroom where the elections were, and then someone gave you the piece of paper with the name of all the candidates. And you were supposed to fold this paper and put it in a box. Not even look at it. Because all the names of all the candidates stood already there, and you had just to accept it. So about 80% of all the names were from this Socialist Unity Party, all the 20% were from the other parties. And you just had to put it in there. This is how these communist election res electional results come together, 99%. Because everybody just did this. 
But people in East Germany, since 1985, were not very happy with this situation. So they tried to, um, in order not to um, get into the eyes of the police or of the Stasi, they tried to go the legal way. So if there's an election, uh, then people can go there if they count the votes. And this is what people did in June 1988. They went into the different places where the elections were held and counted with the officials the votes. And then they put all the numbers together. And they found out, okay, still the vast majority, because it takes a lot of bravery not to take this sheet and fold it and put it in, it takes a lot of bravery to say, well, no, I don't like this name, I don't like this person, which would be my right, but you're not supposed to do that. About 75% still of the votes got to the official government. And then the next day the results came out, 98%. Something is wrong. We counted 75% and they counted 89%. We have the proof that it's not true. And they started complaining about it. And this comes together with another movement, with the, with the movement in East Germany that was opposing um, the government um, environmental movement had a big impact on the coming down of the wall, on the transition from East German to the unification. Um, all kind of um, underground groups, blues music, um, gay and lesbian movement. There was no official place. There was no place. So all these people, um, uh, individual groups, I don't know, marching bands that did not want to be part of this big youth movement. Um, and they found their homes uh, among, under the roofs of the churches. They could meet uh, under the roof of the churches. And they could form groups there. For the first time, people found a space, a kind of safe space, where they could talk, where they even though they knew or they were aware of the fact that probably one of them or two of them were working for the Stasi, were working for the security service, still there were people that were at least pretending to have the same opinion as I did. And this later led to the coming down of the war. And in May 1989, in May 1989, uh, Hungary and uh, Austria decided to take down the fence that was marking their border. Hungary beco uh, belonging to Eastern Europe, Austria belonging to Western Europe. And they took down the fence as a sign of appeasement. It was still illegal to cross this border if you didn't have a permission, but de facto you could. It was just one step. So what people did from East Germany was to go to Hungary, crossed this border illegally, and from Austria they went to West Germany or West Berlin and knocked on the wall from the other side. It's about, it's an estimate, we don't know for sure, 5% of the population of East Germany left the country between summer 1989 and November 1989. So imagine in six months time, half a year, 5% so now the East German government was in need to do something. You cannot be ignored of that. So something changed every single day. On the 7th of October, 7th of October 1989, the 40th anniversary of East German Republic, and all the socialist leaders came to East Berlin to celebrate this among them. Khrushchev, who was not happy with this guy, Erich Honecker, the leader of East Germany. And he was not happy with that, with, with the Soviets. But still, they could not say, well, the Soviets are not socialist enough. So they had to invite them. On this occasion, on the very day, same day, on the 7th of October 1989, um, Gorbachev said a sentence in an interview in East Berlin, if you are too late, you're running out of time. And this sentence somehow became iconic for the end of East Germany. But this is the very same day that people in East Berlin were these opposition groups 
more and more started to say, we don't want to sit in a room in the church, we want to go on the street, started to get on the streets. On that day, the 7th of October 1989, all the Soviet leaders were having a big party in the city center of East Berlin. At the very same place, at the very same time, people on the street were marching in opposition to the East German government. And the East German government sent the police with their dogs, with their baitings, with their guns. This was the first time to this extent that the East German government was beating down the people. And that was just it. This was the moment where people in East Germany said, we are done. If you get the chance to see the movie Goodbye Lenin, which is a very funny, interesting, lovely movie about the transition from east to west and how people dealt with this, the very first scene begins, begins with pictures, with footage from this day where policemen, socialist policemen, were beating down socialist people. This was the day when people to start, started to say, now it is. And this is the day when these uh, Monday marches started. This is a picture of Leipzig, the town about um, two hours drive south of um, Berlin, where people to say, started to say, now it is enough. And more and more people went on the street. Um, the Monday marches started in the mid-1980s with Monday prayers. People met in churches every Monday night, prayers for people that were in the prison, people that could not uh, do the jobs that they wanted to do because they were not, they did not have the right political um, ideas. In 1989, they started to pray for the people in China, on the Tiananmen Square, for the people in Poland. And more and more people were joining these manifestations. Actually, the building here in the corner is the headquarters, the regional headquarter of the Stasi. So people were afraid of the Stasi for 40 years and now they are marching, hundreds of thousands of them, just by the building and saying to them, in their face, you are out. The slogan of these manifestations was, we are the people. We are the people. And you cannot just decide what you like against us. And even more, you cannot take your bait and beat us down to it. One day I clearly remember is just three days, not five days, sorry, five days before the war came down, is this manifestation, the 4th of November, 1989. This is in Berlin. Um, after the events that night, uh, intellectuals, writers, actors, philosophers uh, of East Germany um, organized a big manifestation in Berlin on Alexander Square. That's the largest manifestation in East Germany ever held. 700,000 people attending this manifestation. And the slogan was, this is our land. This is our country. In two, with two meanings. First of all, this is our land. This is our country, not the government. If the government is running this country against the will of the people, this is wrong. And the second meaning was, this is our country, we want to stay here. We don't want to go to West Germany, this is our home. Why should we leave? And then it was a Saturday. In East Germany, Saturday was a school day. <laughs> this is one reason alone why East Germany should go. <laughs> if there would be any country where only Monday is school day, I would go there. Immediately. Um, Saturday was a school day. And I remember in my school, so I was in, in seventh grade, but in seventh grade, um, just starting to develop a sense of politics, just starting to develop a political opinion, but already sensing something is going on. Um, but the seventh grade, and I remember the grades above us, we, were, we wanted to go to this manifestation. And we were talking in a big room with a principal. 
We were arguing with the principal because it was school day. We were not supposed to. Now picture this. In a kind of revolutionary situation, you want to go to a manifestation. You want to express your dislike of the government. And you ask the principal for permission to do so. That's quite of <coughs> ironic. Bless you. Thanks. The principal being kind of a picture of the administration, feels that she has to argue with the students. She could have said easily, no, you're not going. But she finds herself into a, in a position where she feels, I need to talk to them. I cannot just say, it's done. I found that quite interesting. And now let's tear down the wall, finally. Uh, um, by the, one thing I... Um, forgot this. Um, another, another idea behind this manifestation, those people, those intellectuals coming from East Germany was um, to find a so-called third way. So they were done with the socialist system like they have seen it for the last 40 years, but they did not want to, cap to have the capitalist system. They were looking for a way, the third way in between. I sometimes um, I think there are similarities to the Occupy movement nowadays. I don't know if that makes sense, but to find a way not to to have different options and say none of not not one of these options is sufficient. I need to want to find another way. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, not everything has to make sense. <laughs> um, this is the night of the 9th of November 1989. So everything changes. Um, every single day something new. Um, East German government has to do something about it, so they allow political groups to speak up. They allow um, newspapers to be printed, um, bulletins. Um, everything, something is new. On the 7th of November 1989, the, the government meets during the day, and in the evening they have a press conference to let everybody know uh, about their wisdom. Um, this man, Günter Schabowski, held holds this press conference, he did not attend the meeting. So he ju had just what the guys in the meeting wrote down, and he was not attending the meeting. Now, 40 years East Germany, 40 years communism, socialism, um, when you open the newspaper, or if you read the news, it goes like this. Today we built 20,000 tractors, and we made 40,000 people happy. And the next day, Today we built 25,000 tractors and we made 50,000 people. And that's the same, every single day. Every single day. At some point, you don't turn on the TV. At some point, you don't read the news. Now, when everything is changing, if there is something happening every single day, some, suddenly news become interesting. And press conferences become interesting. Have you ever seen a press conference on C-SPAN? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Longer than one hour? No. <laughs> well, people did by then. People did by then. Um, so Günter Schabowski, the guy here, um, reads out, so we do this and we change that, and then we're going to do this and that. And uh, the last thing, about 7 o'clock, about 7 o'clock in the evening, um, he says, um, and by the way, uh, the East German government allows people uh, to visit their friends and families in West Berlin and West Germany. Okay, thank you. Everyone's ready to go. One journalist from Italy says, uh, Mr. Chabosky, when is this going to happen? Well, I don't know. It doesn't say on my paper, so I guess now. <laughs> <laughs> All the journalists go. Okay, let's see. People in East Berlin. <laughs> people in East Berlin watching that press conference. Did he just say we can go? Let's find out. <laughs> so people in East Berlin, in the night, went to the border. And sometimes, if you look at the footage from this, from this night, from this day, you see there's one very iconic scene, an elderly lady in her pajamas with a coat, overcoat. She was watching the news, probably ready to go to bed. Mm, I'm going to see what happens there. More and more people showing up. Border guards, not knowing what would happen. Shall we shoot? Shall we go home? 
trying to call their generals. They are home, they're already in bed, no one has an answer. So at some point they decide, okay, let's take these people that are here, bring them, allow them to go to West Berlin and tell them to be back in tour. <laughs> now, cameras in West Berlin filming people that night. Oh, we're just coming from East Berlin. Isn't that great? More people, more people in East Berlin seeing that, but they are in West Berlin. I want to be there as well. So more and more people, more and more people going to the border. And then shortly before midnight, the border guards, they just give in, open up the gates. And that was how the border Berlin Wall came down. And then over the next weeks, the whole wall, the whole wall, the whole Berlin Wall was cut down, was taken down. And then, not even one, one month later, Germany was reunified, 3rd of October, 1930. Sometimes history makes sense. <laughs> um, so, the wall came down, and Berlin was, uh, Germany was about to be reunified, and this not, does not directly has to do with the German reunification, but this is just another picture. Um, and again, as I told you, the day when the war came down, in my perspective, is one day among many others. This is another day. This is the 15th of January, 1990. Um, I showed you earlier my Stasi file, and I told you um, that towards the end of East Germany, the Stasi tried to destroy as many farms as possible. This is the Stasi headquarter in East Berlin. And people on that night, the 15th of January, 1990, occupied the Stasi headquarter in order to stop the destruction, the destroying of those Stasi farms. So they wanted to keep the files, to know what happened. And what is interesting, on this day, I was not there, um, is two things. It was the birthday of my sister. My sister is 10 years younger than me, so it was her fourth birthday, and we had a family. And uh, my grandparents were there. And I'll come back to this in a second. The, the other thing is that um, we had a class in school that was called Staatsbürgerkunde, um, science of being a good citizen. <laughs> Roughly translated. So in East Germany, that was a class where you would learn how much better the socialist system is than the capitalist system. In this time of change, it was hard for the teacher to tell you how much better the socialist system is when the socialist system is actually imploding. <laughs> so the, the teachers that were promoting socialism, they had to change somehow. And it was hard for them to look different. It was hard for the students to look different. If someone is telling me for two years how great the socialist system is, and now everything falls apart, it's hard to respect this person. Now, this teacher, my teacher, um, did something trying to kind of customized to the situation. So she did a project that we had to interview people from all the po different political directions that suddenly could express themselves. And uh, so some of my fellow students, they, uh, talked, they uh, volunteered to talk to conservatives, to liberals, um, different to in, uh, uh, environmental groups. And I volunteered to talk one pastor that was involved in the East German um, opposition. I was attending this family meeting, and when I said, okay, now I have to go, I'm gonna have an appointment with this pastor, my grandfather told me, well, don't let him tell you the wrong details. Be sure that he tells you the right story. Meaning, that there is only one right story, that there's only the socialist story. Now, my parents and my family was not involved into the system. They were not high rank officers or politicians or whatever, but they somehow identified themselves with 
East Germany after 40 years of living there. And they were suspicious that this pastor, being active in the opposition, would somehow demolish their own history. And then when I met this pastor, this pastor told me off at some point and said, I have to go because I'm going to go there to make sure that we save the stance of us. So um, I was telling you that people in the East, uh, in East and West develop differently. How can you bring two different people together? How can you bring two different uh, nations together and turn them back into one? Um, from a West German perspective, this was the tar, this was the task, this was the asset. This is a satirical magazine, Titanic. I love it very much. It's very ironic. It's very bad, very dark. And this was the front, the front side in November 1990. Sohn and Gabi, Gabi from the zone, from the eastern zone. She's 17 years old. She's now in Happy Land, West Germany. My first banana. <laughs> So this was, in an ironic way, how people from West Berlin, from West Germany, looked at their brothers and sisters at the East. They had funny hairdos, and it's true if you look at pictures that, uh, from that time, that East Germany, in many ways, looks ten year, about 10 years behind than the West. If you look at uh, clothing, if you look at uh, electronics, uh, in so many ways, uh, style of music. I don't know, not, you probably have heard the 1980s um, beat music, hip hop, the beginnings of hip hop music, the beginning of uh, um, graffiti style. Ger East Germany was always about 10 years behind. Uh, people in East Germany wore these funny clothing that were considered to be very cheap jeans clothing, and they did not even know what a banana. So, uh, from a West German perspective, East Germans, they were, they were a bit behind, and they did not know anything about it. And this is, of course, this is an ironic approach to, to it, but like many ironic approaches, it has true substance. Um, because people from West Germany, now the East German socialist economy, political system imploded, um, were telling the East Germans off. And like my grandfather, many people growing up, living in East Germany, they somehow identified themselves with the country. Even though they were not socialist by heart. Even though they were not promoting or uh, supporting the system 100%. But they had their own all day life. They had their ordinary life. They had a job, they had a family. They tried to have a nice home. And now they're told off. You work 40 years in a factory, and now someone comes to you suddenly telling you, well, whatever effort you made, it's all a joke. It's all worth nothing. And it's true that people in East Germany were offended. That was the time when uh, something came up. No. 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 Uh, we call it in East Germany um, Yama Ossi and Besser Vesi. Vesi being someone from the West, Ossi being someone from the East. Besser Vesi is the better Westerner. That person who knows everything. Who knows everything better, who tells you what to do, what not to do. And it's true that if you live in East Germany and uh, if you want to go to university, it doesn't depend on your, not completely, on your grades. It doesn't depend on your personal presentation. You don't have to care about it. To get a car, or to get a stereo does not depend on how hard you work. That people in East Germany did not have this career model like people in the West. I remember in this time, um, in this time, in the 19, early 1990s, one of my teachers uh, telling us, you have to sell yourself because we were so quiet. We were not educated to present ourselves. We were not educated to show show up. We were not educated to make clear, yeah, I am, and I'm a valuable person. So she told us, you have to sell yourself. If you want to get a job, it's not coming to you. You have to get it. 
And you have to convince people that you are the right person. You have to speak up. Many people in East Germany did not like that. They did not like to be told. So this is when the Besser Vesi, the person from the West who knows everything better, was like the evil person. And this is just the graphic death to all Besser Vesis. And the equivalent in East Germany would be the Yamaosi, the whiny, whimsy person from the East. Uh, now they're taking away my political system, and now they tell me what to do, and uh, I have to write applications, I did not have to do that before. Um, why do I have to find a job? It always came to me. This whimsy Aussie, that was kind of a picture how people looked at the people, at the person from East. But um, let me give you just a little bit of uh, background before um, we come to one main issue that links back to uh, the history. Um, even though we had two countries, we had two states, East Germany and West Germany, still the Allies were officially in charge. Even though 1949 East Germany and West Germany were founded, still the four Allies were on the paper in charge of Germany. So when Germany wanted to reunify, when the East Germans to, wanted to reunify, they had to ask permission from the four allies. The wall came down November 1989. The reunification happened October 1990, so 11 months. When we look back, two states, two completely different, not completely, but very different states, four allies, just after the end of, of the Cold War, trying to figure out how to create this new state within 11 months. You don't even get a budget nowadays in 11 months. If you have any political debate, let leave alone a reunification of a country, you would never make it. So when we look back now, it is, it is a miracle that it only took uh, 11 months. So, so um, this, is, this is the moment when, this, uh, when uh, all the debates were, were finished, when uh, the two German states, East Germany and West Germany, and the four allies uh, finally agreed about reunification of Germany. We have um, uh, the uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs of West Germany, we have the Prime Minister of East Germany, we have the French for Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Erhard Schellert-Nazi, the Soviet uh, Affairs, foreign affairs, Hurt, British foreign affairs, and James Baker, American Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Um, it was, even though it only took 11 months, it was a hard task because not everyone was happy with the idea of having a reunified Germany, especially these two guys did not like it. Especially the, the Soviets did not like the idea. Um, they did especially not like the idea of having a big Germany in the NATO. Losing this little bit of East Germany to what was still the other side of the Cold War. And they needed money. So at some point they agreed that Germany could reunify, could be a member of the NATO, if Germany would pay for the Soviet soldiers still in East Germany. Because Soviet Union did not have money to bring their boys back home. About two million Soviet soldiers in East Germany and they did not have money to bring them back. So Germany for the next five years until 1995 paid for all the Soviet soldiers to go back to the Soviet Union. And the other one opposing the, your, the reunification was the British. They did not like the idea of having one big Germany in the middle of Europe because they were afraid of this. And this, again, is a, is a sketch. It is a bit satirical, it's a bit ironic, but again, it is very true to some extent. This was what many people, and in Great Britain you might remember Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, um, also child of the Cold War, and many people in France were scared of. Germany being reunified and turning into a fourth Reich, into a kind of Nazi aggressor again. And this is an actual sketch from a British newspaper. 
So Germany had a big task convincing everybody that we learned a lesson and we're peaceful now. In Germany, I told you about the SLS and the Yamarossi. Um, there were tensions between how um, can we bring these two nations, these two people together and create one without putting, putting, putting anybody down. I told you about, uh, showed you the picture from the manifestation in Berlin trying to find a third way. But in fact, this is what happened, that Germany, West Germany just ate up East Germany. There were two options to reunify both countries. One was we take both and we crea create something new. And there was the other option, and this is what actually happened. West German Chancellor sits there and waits for the apple to ripe and just do it up. This is what actually happened. And this is what caused some tensions in post-reunification Germany, because people from East Germany thought their history, their part, what they had to bring in into Germany was not respected, was not appreciated. Um, we have something, or we had something in East Germany called nostalgia, or ostalgia. Because when everything that you grew up with is taken over by what, by what existed in the West, is taken away, then you somehow feel sorry about it. Does it have anything to do with nostalgia? nostalgia? Yeah, they, 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 no, that's, that's very true. That's very true. Nostalgia. And you just cut off the end. And then you have Ost, which is the German word for East. And people were thinking, well, everything was better in the East. You know, I did not have to look for a job. Um, I did not have to care about how do I pay my car because I could not get one anyway. Um, but, but also, and this is, a, this is actually a screenshot from one of the movies I was talking about earlier, Goodbye Lenin. Uh, the story is that uh, the mother of this young man attends the manifestation on the 7th of October, gets beaten down by the police, falls into a coma, wakes up a few months later after the reunification. And the son tries everything possible to create an artificial East Germany around his mother, so she doesn't get shell-shocked and falls back into a coma. And he has to spend a big effort. So what he does, he is uh, hiring one of his friends who creates the news. When his mother wants to turn on TV, of course you don't have East German news anymore, so they make up mock, mock East German news. But also simple things, and this is a, now in Germany it's a running gag, Spreewald Pickel, Pickels. In East Germany, pickles were different than in West Germany. They had another label. This man is running in whole Berlin trying to get glasses of pickles with this East German label. And he could not find some. Everything that existed in East Germany was taken over. In the late 1990s, we have a backlash that many companies started to produce again products from East Germany. And people in former East Germany start to support these, these products, start to buy these products, because it's somehow nostalgia. This is another side effect of uh, the reunification. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, as a result of growing up in East Germany. Uh, well, it is illegal to do that. In, in Germany, it is illegal. Still, Germany, you probably have heard of um, in the 1990s, still now, but not as much as in the 1990s, has a lot of trouble with neo Nazis. Neo Nazis are chasing down immigrants. Um, this picture was taken in Rostock, in the town of East Germany, Northeast Germany, uh, in 1992, where this happened. Many young people young man gathered around a house where um, immigrants, the guest workers, uh, were living, and they threw Molotov cocktails at this building and burned down this building. Scared everyone, uh, all the immigrants in this building. No one was harmed in this situation, but there were other events uh, where people died. Turkish immigrants, Vietnamese immigrants, uh, one from Angola, they died. This was not a group of 
young people that did not know what to do with themselves. Many people from that area joined those young men. And there was a big problem, big issue in Germany in the 1990s. And one theory, one theory is, it comes from this. This is a picture, actually, the theory comes from a, a psychologist in Germany in 1998, and he is kind of the CSI in Germany, or at least he sees himself this way. And he um, had the theory that all this neo-Nazi movement, and nowadays about 3%, 4% of all the votes in elections go to neo-Nazi parties still, um, comes from this from growing up in a controlled, organized society. This is a picture from East Germany in a, pre, in a kindergarten, preschool kindergarten, when people, where the kids went to the potty at the same time. And he said, his theory is, if you grow up in an organized society, where you're told what to do, even to go to the potty, and suddenly this structure is missing, you look for another structure. And this turns you, or might turn you, into a neonat. What do you think about this? Does that make does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah. It's kind of weird, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like Amish people. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like when they're 18 or something, something to that effect, they're, they're allowed, allowed to leave. leave. Yeah. yeah, they're allowed to leave and oftentimes they make their way back and mm -hmm. reintegrate themselves into their own society mm -hmm. because of the structure. Okay. It's everything that every new group yeah, yeah. yeah. They love that structure. That's what they know. So it's, it's a sense of scary country. not having that structure. Yeah. Anybody else? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what do we do about this? Well, what do we do? I mean, we have 15 million people from East Germany. What do we do with them? We don't want them change. all to be turned into Nazis. Change the structure. Provide some sort of structure. Mm -hmm. well, uh, yeah, bring the but I, I, I can I can see how like even um, even even like you, if it's everything you ever know, and then somebody steps in and says, "No, it's it's all lie. It's all backwards. This is this is the way, it, really, the rest of the world works, and how you should work, and how really the best society is." I can totally, I can understand why, um, people people wouldn't like that, and and want to think that kind of I guess their free thinking is together in this structure, and we want to compensate and find this structure. So I don't know how you kind of break it, every like break this up. Breaking it up in itself is almost that's, that's, hindering the free thinker. That's the difficult thing. If you, if you give them any other structure, how do you know, or how do you make them clear that your structure is the right structure? It is. It is. It is not. It's hard to say. Part of it has to do. Part of it has to do. And finally, we and we're still in this process of bringing the two Germans together. Um, part of it has to do with the economy. That the economy in East Germany was terrible, especially compared to the economy um, in West Germany. Housing and everything that we uh, have heard before. And it still is. Because if the economy is bad in what was East Germany, all the young people tend to leave the area. They go to where the jobs are. So in some parts of what was East Germany, there are only older people. Uh, we have in East Germany, generally speaking, the tendency to vote for more conservative parties. And conservative meaning in a way of thinking, not in a political way. So we, in East Germany, we tend, people tend to vote more for neo-Nazi parties or for communist parties. Everything, all these parties, everyone who seems to give you a structure, which is kind of ironic, the neo-Nazi and the communist, they don't seem to fit. It is about conservative thinking. Um, 
And we're still working. If you come to my house in Berlin, I come, was born in East Berlin, now I live in what was West Berlin, but you don't see the difference. If you would go to this little village, would ask older people, they might tell you, yeah, everything was better. But generally speaking, in Germany, you don't see the difference. Okay. Yeah, when it when the wall first came down and whatnot, like, to what extent was there like infrastructure in the in the east side? Like, I feel like um, kind of the way you laid it out was that a lot of the a lot of the um, kind of government spending and everything was going towards building apartments. Yeah, which doesn't really support a Western economy. This you was other factories. This like was part. Infrastructure. This was part uh, of this agreement uh, okay. before. At the same time, when the uh, the conversation with the uh, um, talking started with the allies between the two German states, they were okay. Uh, so it was not all at once, step by step, step by step. Uh, West German economical and political system was adopted by the East yeah. Germany. Yeah. All right. Thank you very